All right. So, a um, little bit of, uh, we'll start with just a little bit of background on Oregon Wild, and then we'll jump into the gear, uh, and then also some snowshoeing tips and safety pieces, and then where to go in the Mount Hood region. And based on that poll, uh, I'm sort of on the fly going to try and reconfigure how to maybe spend a little more time on that discussion, given the, the level of interest there. But I uh, don't want to gloss over some of these other important pieces to the snowshoeing experience as well. So uh, Oregon Wild, um, some of you may be familiar with uh, the, our organization. We're statewide. Uh, we work on a variety of different things, including protecting wildlife habitat, uh, whether that's pileated woodpeckers, uh, protecting wolves in Oregon or the Klamath Basin, and Ewoks too. Yes, it is technically accurate, um, given that Ewoks lived in redwoods. Um, and we do have redwood trees that we are working to protect here in Oregon down on the south coast, right near the, the California border. So uh, key part of our mission, protecting that Ewok habitat. Uh, but we've also been uh, over the years involved in protecting a number of places you've probably enjoyed or, or been to, or at least hopefully heard about, like the Mount Jefferson Wilderness, uh, a variety of different places on the Mount, around Mount Hood, uh, Mount Thielsen, the lightning rod of the Cascade, which is down near Crater Lake. Um, involved in helping protect the Strawberry Mountain Wilderness out in um, Eastern Oregon, as well as the Three Sisters Wilderness here in my backyard. I work out of our, our Bend office, um, but worked out of our Portland office uh, for a number of years. Um, so the Three Sisters Wilderness, another favorite. Um, following up on Aaron's poll questions, one for you just to think about, um, what percentage of Oregon is permanently protected? Um, and, and I'll give you a clue. If you compare Oregon to our neighboring states, uh, California has protected 15% of their state uh, as wilderness. So with wilderness being the gold standard for public land protection, um, what percentage of Oregon has been protected? 15% in California. Washington has protected 10% uh, of their state. Sad, cold-hearted truth is we have only protected 4% of Oregon um, and so no matter how you measure that or where you fall on the spectrum, uh, we need to do a better job of protecting our, our natural treasures. Um, even the progressive liberal bastion of Idaho, I would say fully tongue in cheek, has protected uh, way more than that at about 10% in Idaho as well. So uh, we've got some work to do there. That's part of what Oregon Wild does. Um, and so there are a variety of campaigns we have around the state um, to protect additional places for habitat, for clean drinking water. Um, we're working on the River Democracy Act, which was introduced by Senator Wyden uh, in the previous Congress, presumably, hopefully, reintroduced uh, before too long in the new Congress. Um, this would protect places like this here across, amazing rivers across Oregon, like the McKinsey River featured here. Um, and a wild and scenic river designation, it's not quite as strong as a wilderness designation, but it, it's pretty, pretty solid. It protects a, a buffer on both sides of the river. Um, no new dams, no clear cutting of old growth, no new mining types of operations. Um, so River Democracy Act, we're very excited about this legislation. You can see, I won't go through this whole map in detail, but the blue lines are the ones that are proposed for wild and scenic in that legislation. And he just came out with a, a recent addition that's a little bit less than this, but this kind of gives you a a sense of the scale of, of how many streams would be protected. Some of the best, coolest, neatest streams we have in Oregon, including the South Fork Walla Walla River. Yes, that is a moose. Um, this is out in far Northeast Oregon, um, as well as the Little Sandy River uh, up near Mount Hood. Um, so a number of different rivers would be protected by that legislation. Uh, we've also been working on things like figuring out how to better balance conservation, recreation, logging, fire, um, all of those different things on, on places like Mount Hood, where there's a lot of recreational pressure, but there's also a lot of really important wildlife habitat. Um, if you've been up there in the winter, trying to go skiing or get to snow parks, you've probably found uh, sometimes it's, it's a little crowded. Um, so making sure that we're uh, advocating for sustainable recreation that uh, minimizes impacts on wildlife is another type of thing that Oregon Wild works on. Um, so let's jump into the gear conversation. Um, for snowshoes, um, and, and maybe preface this by taking a step back here, big picture. 
if you haven't snowshoed before, it's a pretty easy new activity to do. This is not um, learning how to uh, take on some new complicated sporting activity with tons of gear and um, it needs lots and lots of practice before you're even moderately competent. Snowshoeing is pretty simple. Um, so it's very accessible for a lot of folks. Um, if you haven't tried it and you're interested, um, I hope you do. Um, I, I would recommend maybe renting a pair of snowshoes first before purchasing them. Just make sure you like it, go out once or twice. Um, you can maybe try a couple different types of snowshoes. Um, if you go and you want to buy snowshoes, if you're renting them, uh, whether it's at Next Adventure or the Mountain Shop or Autos or any other after a recreation store between Portland and Mount Hood, they've, they've all got snowshoe rentals. Um, on busy weekends, you might want to call ahead um, just in case you don't want to get all the way up to Sandy, have plans to rent snowshoes there, and then they're sold out and there are no other shops uh, further up the mountain, or, or maybe you could get lucky at one of the ski areas. Um, so maybe do it ahead of time or just get it in Portland on your way out where you've got a number of chances. Um, and, and yeah, and so as far as the snowshoes themselves go, um, there are different designs for the vast majority of us who are going to snowshoe and do pretty casual day trips, you know, three, four or five miles. Um, you don't really need to stress out about which snowshoe you have. Um, the, the, the snowshoes of today um, have come a long way from those big wicker snowshoes that you used to to see those are now more appropriately used as decoration on walls. Every once in a while, you'll see somebody wearing those out on the trails, but not very often. So here, here you've got a, a much more standard snowshoe um, where you're putting your, your boot in here, um, got some straps here, a couple buckles, usually pretty simple, um, but it, you know, it does take a minute the first time you do it. Um, oftentimes there is a left and a right, so keep an eye on that. Um, the one, one thing uh, you want to make sure you don't do is put your foot too far forward. Um, there is this function where as you're walking, your, your foot, your heel stays up in, the, in, in your shoe and the heel of the snowshoe will drag on the ground. And that's easier, less effort for you. If your foot is too far forward and you start rubbing up against the top here, then the snowshoe is going to lock in place and you're just going to work harder. Um, so you don't want to do that. So just make sure you don't put your foot too far forward. If you don't put the straps on too um, tight enough, um, then you're probably going to have them fall off, which is fine. It happens all the time to all of us. Um, so put them on tight. But if you feel it, if you put it on so tight that you feel it pinching on your boot, uh, you don't really want it that because then you're probably going to get a blister and it's probably too tight. Um, there are generally two different designs of snowshoes out there these days, um, and both work great, again, for these sort of casual um, four, five, six, seven mile outings, uh, day trips. Um, this, is, this one has sort of this webbed um, covering that, that goes uh, between the, the metal frame that goes all the way around the edge. The other kind had, and these work great in most circumstances, uh, if you're out on an icy day, the other primary kind you'll see can work a little bit better. Um, both have teeth on the bottom, but the other kind is, it's much more of a rigid plastic design for the whole thing. Um, and those just tend to have a little more teeth around the edges and they're not rounded like these. So if you think you're gonna be in icy conditions, those might be a little better. Those are also a little more indestructible and in what you tend to get when you're renting them. But again, don't worry too much about having exactly the right snowshoe. You can have two different brands, one on each foot, and you're probably going to be just fine. You know, if you're six and a half feet tall um, or, or on the shorter side, you might want to make sure you have an appropriately sized snowshoe. But for most people, um, most snowshoes will work just fine. Um, one question I get, we've led a lot of snowshoe trips over the years, and, and oftentimes people ask about poles. Do I need poles? And if you're a beginner, it, it's probably helpful to have poles, but you certainly don't need them. Um, a lot of people will go snowshoeing without poles. Um, I think if you like to hike with poles, you're probably going to like to snowshoe with poles. Um, also, if you're going out in a little bit icier conditions or longer trips, poles can be helpful. So um, if you got them, they can be great. Um, but if you don't want to use them, you don't like them, 
um, that's certainly just fine too. Uh, I would say more than half of people don't use poles when they're out snowshoeing. Uh, for layers, when you're dressing, you know, how much do I need to bring and where? Um, hopefully most of you are familiar with, you know, not overdressing and dressing in layers, but the main idea being that when you get out of your car, it's the winter time in the morning, it's going to be cold when you get out. And so the tendency is to put everything you got on. You might even throw a blanket around yourself when you head out. Um, but remember, that's probably going to be the coldest you're going to be all day long. Um, once you start snowshoeing and going up the trail, your, your heartbeat's going to get going and the blood's pumping and you're going to warm up um, just fine. So um, keep that in mind. It is winter, you know, so with all of this comes the assumption, the caveat of be prepared um, for changing weather conditions and extra cautious uh, just because uh, you don't want to have any safety issues out in the cold. So if you're wearing a, a number of layers, that can be the, the best way to sort of be like warm when you need it, but also be able to shed a layer once you start uh, cooling down. Uh, gators, certainly not needed, um, but if you're out on a big powder day, you know, snowed a whole lot last night and you really want to kind of go exploring off the trail, gators can be really helpful. And if, if you're not familiar with gators, these are just sort of like a, a piece of fabric that Velcro or tie around um, kind of covering your ankles. So, you know, normally you've got pants that can, snow pants that come down and then your, your boots and at the seam you get snow coming in. This is a piece of fabric that basically wraps around your that, that seam and, and covers you up so you don't get snow going into your boots. Very handy um, if you're going off trail, most of the time not needed. Um, and then on footwear, this is always a fun one. I've, in Over the years of leading snowshoe trips, uh, I've seen uh, all sorts of footwear. Um, there, there's not, you don't need to have any sort of special snow boot. I, I have some sort of uh, snow boots. They're not super bulky. They sort of look like a glorified hiking boot, just a little bigger. I like to use those for snowshoeing. That's great. Most people, vast majority of people just use their hiking shoes, their hiking boots. Um, if they're waterproof, that's great, but it's not essential. Um, if you're out on a day where it's, you know, heavy wet snow and it's maybe snowing hard and or mixing with rain, waterproof matters. On the average cold winter day, your feet aren't going to get soaked. So even if your boots, your hiking boots aren't perfectly waterproof, you'll probably be just fine. Um, but again, keep, keep an eye on the conditions to be safe there. I've also seen a lot of times where people just wear sneakers out uh, when they're snowshoeing. And as long as you're not going off trail, and your feet aren't cold, um, you, you could be okay. I, I don't recommend that, but it's, it's been done and it can be done. Um, as with hiking, you know, anytime you're out on the trail, you want to bring uh, enough food and some extra food and plenty of water uh, for, for safety purposes. Um, you know, with COVID, take all those uh, fun COVID precautions if you're carpooling or anything else, um, you know the drill there. Uh, the 10 essentials, very Googleable, but things like first aid kit, um, those can also be uh, pretty essential. Um, the other essential thing is bring some hot chocolate in the thermos, makes every day better. Um, so highly recommend some hot chocolate before, during, and after snowshoeing. Um, one suggestion I have, this isn't really, this kind of gets segueing out of the gear conversation into some suggestions is, uh, this, there's an app, it's a free app for your cell phone. Um, it's called, it's made by a company called Avenza. Uh, it's called PDF Maps. And this is a great tool for when you're out snowshoeing in different places and you want to have a trail map where you can see where you are. It's very basic. There's not a big, long, complicated learning curve to figuring out this app. Um, and again, it's, it's free for recreational use, personal use. Um, you can load a couple of different maps on there and then swap them out over time. Um, but basically what it does is like here, I've just got a, you can see a, a PDF map that that I, I was able to download that the Forest Service or Nordic Club or whoever makes trail maps, um, variety of folks make these types of trail maps um, around the mountain hood. You can load it in to uh, the, the app and then you'll get a blue dot on the screen that shows you where you are. So, you know, if you're at this intersection or the next intersection, how far you have to go to get back to, to your car, that sort of thing. So a PDF maps made by Avenza. 
Um, highly recommend that as, as a great way. And, and we'll have a follow-up email, email we'll send out with some suggestions for where to find some of the trail maps that you can use in this. Um, and so that will hopefully help you uh, in the process of figuring out where to go and not get lost. All right, so some other tips on snowshoeing. So the one big no-no golden rule of snowshoeing um, is make sure you don't walk with your snowshoes on cross-country ski trails. So as you can see here, um, you've got this, this sort of standard two track. Uh, this isn't super, sometimes it's even more obvious than this, but you can tell somebody cross-country ski, multiple people probably ski through here. If you walk on those with your snowshoes, you're gonna trample that track down. And for anyone who's cross-country skied before, it's really unhelpful. It's great for cross-country skiing to have those tracks already set in the snow. Um, really helpful, makes it a lot smoother and easier going. And so best if we snowshoers can make sure we're not walking on top of those cross-country ski tracks. If you get into a situation where there's a narrow trail and it's not safe and you just have to walk on um, that spot where on, on top of the cross-country ski tracks, safety wins out 10 times out of 10. But um, this is an important tip because while we snowshoers sometimes will have poles with us, the cross-country skiers will always have poles with them. And if you are stomping down their tracks, they will take a swing at you with their poles. They will get very grouchy um, with you very quickly. So fair warning on that. Don't, can't say I didn't tell you so. All right. Um, another uh, helpful tip here is uh, with your snowshoes, don't, don't walk backwards. Um, uh, when that mechanism where I, I described how the, the heel of your shoe stays like this as you step up and then the, the tail of the snowshoe goes, goes down. Um, and, and, and if you try to take a step back, that works fine as long as you're dragging that forward. If you step up and go to step back, the back of your snowshoe is gonna dig into the snow and then you're gonna tip over and fall backwards. Hopefully it'll be a soft landing, no harm done, but uh, most people prefer not to fall. Uh, so just don't walk backwards, walk around a little circle. Um, already talked about not putting your boot too far forward. And then from an effort perspective, if you, uh, snowshoeing, um, it doesn't take that much effort. Most people who do it, they start out walking uh, a little bit awkward for the first 15 minutes, uh, just because they feel obligated to because they've got these things on their feet. And then after 15 minutes, you find you're pretty much walking normally and you're not even really having to think about it. Um, so there's not that much effort, extra effort into it, but there is definitely some. Um, and, and if you are out on a packed down trail, that effort it, it stays about the same. Um, more effort than if you were just hiking, but uh, not uh, super strenuous. If you are going out into an area that no one else has snowshoed on and you're in deep powder, your snowshoes will help keep you afloat, but these are not magic shoes that help you elevate and stay on top of the snow. You still sink in. And when you're, cut, you're the first person cutting the trail, um, it is so much work. Um, you'll, be, you'll find yourself exhausted in five minutes and if, if you're alone. Um, hopefully if you have several people, you can kind of alternate and take turns. So if you don't want to do the super uh, exercise version of this, um, don't be the first one there at 6 a.m. the day after a big snowstorm, because um, or, or or do and and thank you in advance from the rest of us <laughs> for for cutting the trail and, and uh, you know because once once one or two people go through the third and fourth person have a pretty easy uh, route cut for them. So thank you to your early risers. Fair warning to those of you who may be looking for a moderately strenuous uh, activity. Um, one, one thing to think about, and this definitely gets into the where to go snowshoeing around Mount Hood, is when it comes to the difficulty level. Um, I, you might talk to so-and-so and, and your friend will be like, oh yeah, I went to this uh, one trail and it was super easy, great condition, sun was shining, no trouble at all, it's good for beginners. Um, and, and maybe it was last Tuesday, um, but tonight it's going to sleet and hail and be freezing rain 
And tomorrow morning, it's going to be an ice rink out there. And so every trail is going to be an expert trail. So you really need to keep track of the weather conditions and it, it, because that's going to obviously influence the surface conditions of the snow. Um, and that can radically change how good the conditions are. Um, so if, if you're not sure, you know, just to check the, the, the forecast for Mount Hood. And, um, and the one thing to keep an eye on is the freezing level. Um, if the freezing level is uh, above 5,000 feet, you might not want to go snowshoeing that day. That means it's probably going to be uh, raining or, or probably just heavy wet snow um, at most of the, the snow parks. Um, if it's 4,000 feet, choose carefully. Some, some are going to be better than others. Um, if the freezing level is below 4,000 feet, then pretty much all the options are going to be good. It'll be snowing and not raining. Um, and so that's, that's one thing to always, that's, you know, that's the first thing I'm thinking about. I always have a, 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 um, a sense of what the snow conditions are going to be. And, and it both determines how much fun you're going to have that day, but also the difficulty level. Um, so as far as effort goes, again, I think I would maybe use the, the um, comparison of if you would normally go for a hike next weekend and you would go for eight miles, maybe plan on going for a four mile snowshoe, see how you do with that sort of two to one mile ratio. But again, as with everything else, when it comes to hiking, you know, look at the elevation gain of the trail you're looking at doing um, and factor that in. And all of those things can, can certainly make things easier or more difficult. Most of the places around Mount Hood where you're gonna go snowshoeing and, and have to park your car, uh, are called, we call them snow parks, um, and they do require a parking pass. You can get those uh, either a day pass or you can get an annual pass. Both versions are available at uh, every outdoor store, most gas stations, um, and even a number of coffee shops between Portland and Mount Hood. So pretty easy to find. Um, there is a surcharge that some places uh, put on those. So I think like REI, and if you go to, um, uh, the DMV, there's no extra charge, but you, you can always call ahead and make sure. And if you're getting the annual pass, that'll save you four or five dollars and, and maybe a dollar or two on, on the day pass. Um, I think the annual pass, I want to say 20 or 25, and the day pass is like three or four. Um, dogs, uh, check whichever snow park you're going to, look it up online ahead of time to see if dogs are allowed. Dogs are allowed at most snow parks around Mount Hood, um, but check that because it's not always the case and be respectful um, for sure, usual dog rules. Um, when you're out on the trail, um, always keep an eye out for trail signs just to make sure you're going the right way. Um, sometimes you'll see these great signs which show not only are you on a trail, but you're on a snowshoe trail and those are great. Um, sometimes it's just a diamond. It used to be the old ones were just cut out of a, a, a rectangle uh, shape or a diamond shape with a chainsaw into the side of the, the bark on a tree. Um, so those are a little harder to find these days. So keep it out for these more reflective ones that are, that are obvious. Um, depending on where you are, some trails are better marked than others. Um, so, and, and again, credit to all those volunteer organizations um, and trails organizations, Nordic clubs, et cetera, Forest Service for helping uh, both clear these trails of uh, fallen trees, but also putting up those signs and then putting them back up when a tree falls on, on them. Um, one tip for lunch. So a lot of times what I've had is, you know, typically you're, you're snowshoeing along, all right, it's noon, let's, let's stop and have our lunch. And, and by that time you've maybe been going for an hour or two hours um, and you've warmed up. And so you're like, I'm gonna have a nice long lunch, hopefully finally cool down a little bit. Um, you know, so you start out, you're socializing a little bit and you figure out oh, eventually, you know, maybe have a snack and then oh, I'll get to my sandwich in a little bit. Um, I, I would plan on a short lunch when you're snowshoeing, even when it's still relatively warm, 35 degrees out, you're going to cool down pretty quickly once you stop moving, especially if you're sitting down in the snow. Um, if you can, this kind of fits under the gear category, but um, uh, those little thin foam pads can be helpful and they, they weigh almost nothing. So stick one of those in your backpack and you can sit on those. Uh, another trick I do sometimes if I, I always forget to bring mine, it's right next to my snowshoes in the garage, but I always forget it. So a lot of times what I'll do is 
uh, I'll take my gloves off uh, while I'm eating lunch and put those on the snow and I'll sit on those and that helps a little bit. Uh, but you get cold sitting down for lunch. So plan on it, uh, taking, taking a shorter lunch, start with your sandwich and then socialize after if you're still enjoying the, the hangout. Um, sitting down in snowshoes is one of those things you probably don't think about until you want to do it. Um, I, I would recommend not taking my snowshoes off just because they're a little bit of, uh, it takes a little bit of doing uh, for most snowshoes to get them on and off. And depending on where you're having your lunch, um, when you take them off, you might sink down in a lot more than you might want to. So better to keep them on and, and just get back sit down on your butt there. Um, or you can, what I, what I usually do is you, if you get down on your knees um, and then you can just kind of roll over onto your butt and that's a good way to get in and out of the sitting position. Um, as you can see, you know, you kind of kick out the heels and, and sit back and you're good. But if you look at that picture and then think about, well, how am I going to stand up from that position? Don't try and stand up from there, roll over onto your knees and then get up that way. Um, so just another little tip there, trial and error. This is probably the most common question I get um, from people snowshoeing. And I wish I had a solid, perfect, 100% uh, guaranteed answer on this. When you get these massive snowballs on the bottom of your snowshoe, it's not fun snowshoeing in those conditions uh, because those snowballs are heavy and they're also become very cumbersome to walk on top of those. Um, unfortunately, the bad news is there is no easy solution for that. I've, I've heard and researched and talked to a lot of people about what, what they've heard and tried and some people spray cooking oil or cooking spray on the bottom of their snowshoes, like Pam. I have very little faith that that's going to do much. Um, I have heard some people have put um, duct tape very carefully on all of the underside surfaces of their snowshoes. I think that actually would help. I haven't tried it yet myself, um, but you could do that. It, you know, be lots of little pieces of duct tape in various spots. Make sure you don't do it in a way that locks your foot in, but that could help. Um, so the, the other thing is you just don't go snowshoeing on days where it's really warm. If you've had a fresh snow, you're off trail and it snowed, you know, a couple inches yesterday or the day before, um, that's when you're really going to pick up that, that snow. If you're out snowshoeing on a day where it's below 32 degrees, you're pretty unlikely going to get that. Um, sometimes what, what a lot of people try and do is you just click your shoes together, bang them together, not too hard, but hard enough um, that it knocks the snowballs off. That, that'll buy you some time. I, I, my experience has been once you get to that point, try that once or twice. And then if it keeps sticking, you, it might be better to just take the snowshoe off and really dig all the snow off. And that can buy you a little more time, but it's just one of those few uh, not great things about snowshoeing. All right, so a few things on safety. So uh, tree wells and, and the safety part is one of these things um, where, where I hesitate to even mention safety for snowshoeing because it's one of the safer things you can do out there in the winter. Um, it's probably more dangerous driving to the mountain um, than it is actually just doing the snowshoeing. This is not learning to bobsled uh, where you need a helmet and all sorts of crazy gear. Uh, so I, I want to make sure I don't scare anyone off of snowshoeing because it sounds uh, like you need to remember all these key safety features. But I will go through a few for good order. Uh, tree wells um, have form, form after you get a lot of snow. Typically, they're most common right after you've really had some big snowstorms uh, for the next couple of days afterward. Um, and as you can see here, the snow falls on the tree branches and it doesn't accumulate underneath the tree. And so then you get these tree wells, these open air, air pockets, um, and they may not be very visible. So, you know, here we're looking at this tree and we can kind of peek in from the backside. But if you were looking at it from this direction over here, you, it might not be so obvious. Much more of an issue if you're a downhill skier, you should know about tree wells on powder days. For snowshoeing, not as big of a concern, but something to be aware of. Um, sometimes you may only see a little bit of a tree sticking out above the snow, and there might be a sizable tree well there. So if you want to be extra cautious right after a storm for a while, 
um, don't don't walk too close to, to trees. Um, if, if somebody else already has footprints going through a track, um, then you know if somebody's tested it, it's probably safe. But that's one thing to think about. And I've got a, a little video here that'll um, show you what these look like. This guy's gonna, gonna test out this tree well here. That's pretty wild. Um, you don't want to do that the wrong way. Um, if if you ever do get in that situation, um, one of the things you want to try to do is obviously never be alone. That's one of those safety things. If you're out snowshoeing or doing any outdoor activity, always good to be with people um, so that they, your your buddy can help dig you out. Um, but hold on to the as if you feel like you're falling into a tree. Well, grab onto the branches or the trunk of the tree. Um, that can help you so that you're you don't go head first down, you'll, you'll keep your upper body up um, and it'll be much easier to get out that way. Um, one other thing, safety purpose wise, and this one again, this is sort of like, you might get struck by lightning. Pretty unlikely, but maybe, maybe a little slightly more common. Again, this is a winter wonderland out there and you might have these big snow accumulations in the branches up above you. And as it warms up or the wind blows, a little bit might fall off the tree branch here, a little there. And sometimes the, the, I think we have this instinct to look up and see where's that coming from. I, it's not the right instinct um, in these situations. So if you notice you're, you've got a little bit of chunky snow falling on you, keep your head down, walk a few more steps, and then look back at where it was coming from. Because sometimes these big snowballs fall down. And, and those little ice pellets that are falling down, you don't really want to catch those in your face either. So um, Proceed cautiously, keep going, and then turn around and look back. Um, false trails is another uh, interesting thing to keep an eye out on. I was actually snowshoeing last weekend and found this, and it kind of threw us off our, our course. So imagine this, you're the first one out after a snowstorm last night. And so you go out and you start on the trail, and then without realizing it, all of a sudden you're out and you're going, and, and you're not on the trail anymore. But Whoever comes after you is going to see where exactly where your tracks went, and they're going to follow you because it looks like that's where the trail goes um, because no one else has been anywhere and anywhere else in, in the forest there. So um, be aware of that, that the person who went before you, the, the, the fish, the, you know, the, the tracks may not be the trail. Most of the time they are, but every once in a while, somebody says, I'm taking a shortcut or I'm didn't mean to go there, or maybe it's intentional, maybe it's not. Um, so just, you know, have your app out, make sure you're familiar with where you're going, um, and, and watch out for those false trails. Um, and then I, I would also suggest keep your snowshoes on. There are a number of, of snow parks around Mount Hood where um, you'll find uh, they get pretty packed down, you know, a day or two after the most recent snowstorm. And the, the trail is pretty packed next to it. You know, it can maybe sometimes double wide packed um, and or you maybe are getting close to lower the White River area and it's pretty packed down. Um, I would keep the snowshoes on. That packed down snow can be pretty slippery. Um, you don't want to slide on that and fall down, sprain an ankle, sprain a wrist, whatever. Um, and also it's not going to necessarily always be as packed down as it looks like. It might be here and then a little further down the trail it might not be. And if you get to a spot where it's not as packed down, um, you'll sink down and we call it post holing, where you're all of a sudden you unexpectedly sink down a foot or two feet. Um, and that can be not fun, also lead to injuries, tweaking this, that, or the other ankles. Um, so keep your snowshoes on, even if you don't think you need them, it's not taking that much extra effort. Um, and I, I think, you know, the golden rule of safety is always. Uh, tell someone where you are, where you're going, and what time you expect to be back. So if you don't report back in, um, and some, a lot of people recommend leaving a note on your windshield. It works better in the summer than in the winter if it's snowing and your snow, car gets covered with snow. Um, but those, those are some good tips there. Um, sometimes in the shoulder season of snowshoeing, um, you may come across situations where it's this trail is snow covered for most of the way, but every once in a while there's a spot where it's just dirt. Um, and you're like, ah, do I need to take my snowshoes off for like 10 steps and then put them back on and then half a mile later do it again. Um, 
it's fine to leave your snowshoes on. They're, they're, they're pretty sturdy piece of equipment. Um, you just don't want to walk on rocks um, or, or pavement. So if you you're walking, if it's a really rocky area, then probably worth taking your snowshoes off. If it's rocks, it might be a little slippery too, so be wary of that. Um, but uh, the rocks, uh, what going on then with your snowshoes? The the snowshoes have these teeth on the on the bottom, and these teeth can be really helpful at uh, giving you traction uh, if it's you know crusty or slightly slippery conditions. And if you walk on rocks or pavement, it's going to dull those teeth, and you just won't have as much traction. Um, so you want to keep an eye out for that. Um, and then when you get back to the snow park or wherever you parked, um, if the snow park is totally covered in snow, it's fine to uh, walk the, all the way to your car and then take your snowshoes off. But if, you know, if it's only a half an inch of snow um, or, or there's no snow, take your snowshoes off um, before walking on, on that type of surface. You just, again, don't want to wear down those teeth that give you traction. Okay, moving into where to snowshoe around Mount Hood. Um, number of different options here. This is a, a quick map just to orient people to some of the places we're going to talk about. So obviously we've got Mount Hood here, the, the center of the world here for this discussion. Highway 26 is this white line here. Uh, you get up towards government camp and then you, if you keep going, you'll stay on 26 and you'll end up in Bend. Um, the other main route is you come up past government camp and you can get on Highway 35, which starts here and heads up north towards Hood River. Um, and most of the snow parks you're going to be on at, or, or at uh, are going to be in and off of one of these two roads. Um, there are certainly places you can go there that are not on these uh, highways, but I wouldn't consider them necessarily the Mountain Hood region. Uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll get to uh, when I mentioned Lost Creek. This is um, on on the uh, Barlow Pass Road here. Um, I'm sorry, not Barlow Pass Road. I'm blanking on the name of this road. Obvious road leading out of zigzag. Anyway, it'll come to me. Um, but this is uh, the only one where you get off of the highway for any of these uh, snow parks. Okay, so uh, first one here up is this Lost Creek Old Maid Flat. Um, this is an awesome spot. It has great views of the more north side of Mount, that sort of north and northwest side of Mount Hood. And it's just super cool. It's a view you don't see as much. Most of the views you get in Mount Hood are from the south side, whether it's in the summer or the winter or from ski areas or from the highway or Timberline Lodge, you're seeing the south side. If you go to Hood River, you see the north side. This view is a little more, it's, it's, I, I love it, it's great. Um, so I highly recommend it. And there are a number of spots along the Lost Creek Old Maid Fat Trails um, where you can get some nice views relatively close to the mountain. Um, this, this is not necessarily your entry level snowshoeing. The snowshoeing itself is fine. It's, it's relatively flat in this area. It's just the, the getting there that's sometimes a little tricky. Um, this road is not uh, plowed as regularly as Highway 26 and 35, not surprisingly. Um, and so you, it, sometimes you can drive a mile towards the trailhead and you just have to stop there. That's as far as you can really drive. Sometimes they, plow, you know, if it hasn't snowed in a little, you know, a couple days or a week, um, then it's pretty probably going to be well plowed right to where you want to park for, for the trailhead. Um, so that's one to just kind of keep your eye on. It's it's sort of the uh, mid elevation one as far as that goes, um, but it, it's a little lesser known, um, and you're not going to have the massive crowds that you'll find um, in other places. And if you're familiar with that area, you, there's a couple different places you can go. You can go along this route or that route. So um, some some options there that are official and unofficial. Um, but this and this is again for reference. This is along. Uh, near near the sand, upper Sandy River. All right, another one. This is more common one, a more popular one that folks may have uh, probably already done when they're hiking in the summer is Mirror Lake. Um, you can go up to Mirror Lake, which is great. Uh, that's that's a good distance for a lot of folks. If you've got the stamina and, and you know you got the stamina, 
going up to the, you, you go to Mirror Lake and then you keep going up to the top of Tom, Dick and Harry. And on a sunny day, the views here of Mount Hood and you get 360 views. So you can look south as well from the top and see all the way to Mount Jefferson and Three Sisters. Um, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, so on a sunny day, this is a good one. On a stormy day, again, remember like I talked about earlier, you wanna pick your destination based on the weather. On a stormy day, this is gonna be miserable um, to go up to the top. Going to Mirror Lake is nice because you're in the forest down in that lower set stretch, um, but going up to the top of Tom, Dick and Harry, you'll have no views and you're just gonna have wind blowing snow in your face. So choose accordingly. Um, the one thing I will also say about Tom, Dick and Harry Mountain, uh, the summit, on paper, this is not a difficult snowshoe route. Um, it's not very long. It's not that, you know, it's whatever things like maybe four miles round trip. Elevation gain is uh, not that bad. Um, this one's always more difficult than I think it's going to be. I'm always a little more tired after getting to the top and then getting to the bottom on this one than I think I should be. So uh, maybe that's just me, but factor that in. It might look teasingly easier than it really is uh, with Mirror Lake, Tom Dick, and Harry Mountain. All right, uh, and that's uh, the the Mirror Lake. This one you access right off of Highway 26. You park right near Ski Bowl, um, kind of right in that same turnoff there. And then Trillium Lake, this is another fun one. Um, you get there uh, right, it's at one of the snow parks kind of right in government camp, um, just on the, the sort of the far side of town in Portland. Um, I led a snowshoeing trip th this day, I think it was this day, and we had, it was just a, a crazy day. We were supposed to go to one spot. That spot hadn't been plowed. I think it was Mirror Lake, hadn't been plowed. So we're just driving, you know, it is a blizzard out. It wasn't supposed to be a blizzard. We thought we were having normal weather conditions. Anyway, so we all kind of go into the next snow park. Miraculously, we just found each other there and then came up with another plan. And, all right, let's go to Trillium Lake and try and do that. And no one had cut trail at Trillium Lake. so. Um, and it was like two or three feet of fresh snow in the last couple of days. And so we had this super fun group out and we needed everyone in that group to take turns every 10 minutes. Somebody else had to do the front, uh, front roll to, to cut trail because it's a lot of work, especially uh, on, on a day like that. So it, again, snowshoeing can be a lot of fun and I, I love it on those winter wonderland days. Uh, just be careful driving and all that good stuff. Have a good plan, a car that's ready and able to, to handle the, the conditions. Uh, another great one, and, and so um, Trillium Lake, another one of those mid elevation ones, it's right at pass levels. So if you see the forecast for the pass level, that's gonna mean Trillium Lake. That's, that's what you're gonna get there. Um, Twin Lakes, this is a little bit further past government camp. So you go past government camp um, and then keep going on Highway 26. Uh, past the Highway 35 juncture, and you get to the Frog Lake Snow Park. That's where you pick up the Twin Lakes Trail. There are multiple different trails here, but the main one that most people do is the one that goes to the first of the Twin Lakes. And if you're ambitious, you can go to the second one, um, but most people tend to go to the first one. This one, I, I like this one on iffy weather days, it's a little further to the east. It's not that much farther driving necessarily, but just where it sits in the mountain range, it's slightly more likely to be snowing there than it might be at say uh, Mirror Lake where maybe it's on the edge and it's on the wrong side of the edge and it's raining at Mirror Lake, it might be snowing at Twin Lakes. You also pick up, it, it seems to be right at the cutoff line where as soon as you get out of the snow park, you gain a little bit of elevation and all of a sudden you notice there's significantly more snow around. Um, so this can be a good one um, on those types of days. It's also um, a good one on a stormy day because you're in the forest the whole time um, and it's a, it's a neat higher elevation for us. So um, this, was, this is a good stormy, this is my go-to Mount Hood stormy day snowshoe. Um, I, we did a trip here once. Um, it's, it's like three, four miles round trip if you go to the first lake and back. You start on the Pacific Crest Trail, and then you go off to, to the first uh, of the Mirror Lakes. On a clear day, you go to the side of that lake, you can see a view of Mount Hood, um, a little view, it's a peekaboo view. 
I love this one trip and normally on our, our outings, we'll, we'll go a little distance, we'll stop, we'll catch up, we'll do a little chat, we'll go another little distance. And, and usually it takes, you know, everybody's going at different speeds and people will catch up. And so you're waiting a little minute, catch breath. Um, this day we went and boy, everybody was on my heels the whole way. This was like the most fit group of snowshoers I've ever seen. And so we got to the first lake in record time. I was like, oh, we can't stop here. You know, we just, everybody just finished breakfast. We just started. And so I was like, all right, well, our folks are game for it. Let's go up to the next one. I, I had seen this on the map, so I knew you could do it, but I had never done it. It's a little risky. Uh, I was like, but you know, if, if folks are game, we can go up to the next lake and then maybe get into a lollipop where we connect to the Pacific Crest Trail and then circle back to where we started. I, I, just, I didn't really know how long it was. I should have had a map. That would have been good. Um, and anyway, so we do that, you know, and again, this was billed as a four mile beginner snowshoe trip. And so we get to the next lake. I was like, hmm, that took a little longer than I thought. And everybody's still good. And then, and then we start cutting up towards the Pacific Crest Trail and still, still, you know, okay, wow, this is really, we've been going for a while. Um, and then eventually we get to the PCT and I'm like, geez, this is, this is turned into a trip. And, and then I see the sign that says, to the Frog Lake Snow Park, four miles. And I'm like, oh man, this is not, uh, so that meant we were probably doing something like eight miles plus uh, that day. But it was a great group. I think a few blisters happened, but uh, yeah, plan accordingly. Make sure you know if, you, if, you want, if you're gonna have a backup option to extend it, uh, maybe think about that ahead of time on the map. Um, another fun spot is Barlow View, a little smaller of a snow park, so not as many parking spaces. Um, and maybe that, that's this is a good spot to uh, make a suggestion on that front. So we mentioned earlier that uh, Mount Hood's getting a little crowded. Um, it can be hard, a lot of traffic, hard to find parking places. Remember that a lot of the traffic going up to Mount Hood on the weekends or any day is ski traffic. And ski traffic is really going to be sort of that first thing in the morning where um, if you there, a lot of skiers are going to leave Portland around seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. And so, and, and, and even some maybe closer to nine, but um, really at seven and eight. So if you're wanting to avoid ski area traffic, leave either real early before that, or, or maybe wait till mid morning and go then to avoid some of the traffic. And then you also might have different odds of, uh, if you're going later, um, different odds of some, you, you won't be in the first shift uh, of parking at any given snow park to be in the second shift and something will open up. So one, one trick to try to help um, get, get a spot that can sometimes be uh, easier than said than done. Carpooling helpful, especially if you're not comfortable driving in the snow, uh, go with someone who is and has a, has a car that's got snow tires and chains. Um, so here we got Barlow Butte, another fun one. Um, there's, the trails are kind of short here. You can do a couple of different options. Um, these trails aren't as well marked. Um, so this is a good place to explore if you want to try something new that's not um, at, at as much on the beaten path, but just make sure you know where you're going ahead of time. You can go all the way up to the summit of Barlow View. Um, I've, I've done it. It's pretty tough. Uh, it's a pretty steep climb. It's not very long, but it's a steep climb. And in most snow conditions, it's like, two steps up, one step sliding back, two steps up, one sliding back. And you really become aware of just how good the teeth in your snowshoes are. And, and I think in a lot of snow conditions, you may not even be able to get to the top. It's just too steep. You're just gonna you know, take one step up and slide three steps back and it's just not, not a good fit. But on the right day, um, and again, great views from up there, um, not probably not the entry level uh, snowshoe. Level. Sounds like we've got some folks who have been before maybe looking for something different. So Barlow View could be that. Um, and again, also some neat old growth forests uh, closer in right around the snow park. So you can kind of, if you want to just tool around near there, uh, there's some options there as well. Manos Falls, love this one. Um, not that long ago, I guess dating myself here, 20 years ago, Manos Falls was not that popular. Now it's a little more popular, uh, or it's substantially more popular. So um, you will see some other people on the trail, but this is one where you kind of have to time the snow just right. Um, it's, it's lower elevation. This is off, right off of Highway 35. Um, 
And, and because it's a little lower elevation, it's not always the first one that's plowed right after a big snow. Um, so if, if you're in the middle of a storm, you might not be able to depend on that. Why, it's basically just a real wide spot in the road that's plowed for, for the snow park. Um, factor that in, so maybe don't go right in the middle of a storm or just know that if it may not be plowed and may have to go to plan B. Um, but if the snow levels are, are lower, like 3,000 feet, um, Tomatoes Falls is, is pretty spectacular. Um, early season, not as good because I uh, just haven't had enough low elevation snows yet normally. Um, but once we get into the winter, there's usually a good snowpack. Um, there are a few spots on this trail which can be, they're sort of on the edge of a, a slope. So you, you want to be careful. This is one to make sure you're not pushing your limits. Um, you can go a certain distance and, and it's pretty safe. And then um, again, the safety factor will depend on how the snow conditions are. So you just got to, if you feel like it's slippery, if you're not comfortable, don't push your luck, turn around, go back. Um, but if, if the conditions are right, um, and even these bridges, because you get a ton of snow that can build up on these. And so the snow level, even packed snow, can be way up here near the top. So um, be careful on this one. But uh, it's this, this trail in the summer or winter is just spectacular. You're going right along the East Fork Hood River and then along Cold Spring Creek, uh, Coast Wild and Scenic River in the River Democracy Act we're working on. Um, you got Old Growth Forest. Whitewater Rapids, it's just super cool. Um, and on a stormy day, um, if if it's you know snowing and you're not going to have views elsewhere, this can be good. Again, if it's storming too much, you know, big storm, it may not be plowed. So anyway, a couple things to factor in there with Manos Falls, but great one, hard to spell, but this new tree. Okay, White River Canyon. Um, if you're a beginner, this is probably uh, a good spot to go. This or maybe Trillium Lake. Um, Trillium uh, gets a lot of use as well. Um, if you want to have other people around, so there's comfort. As you can see here with White River Canyon, it's wide open. So you you will, it, it's hard to get lost in White River Canyon. Don't take that as a challenge, it can happen. Um, but on a clear day, this is another one of those ones. I'm checking the weather. If it's a clear day, I like White River because you're you're right up there on Mount Hood and those views are just, I mean, this, this photo doesn't even do it justice and this is impressive. Um, so, and, and if you were to turn around and look down the River Canyon, um, you've got great views there as well. Um, got a couple of snow parks here that you can use to, to access this. Um, the, the Boy Scout Snow Park, which is right next to the main snow park. Um, there is a north side snow park that's on the downhill side of the creek. Um, that is more used by snowmobilers, but you could use that to explore um, I probably wouldn't recommend it, but I'm, I'm sure it could be fun. Um, so White River Canyon, highly recommend for clear days. It's a great one where you can just go as far as you want. Um, eventually you get to a spot, I forget if it's up here or over here, somewhere up in this, uh, where, where you're kind of done. Um, and if you want to keep going, it's going up a really steep slope like this or like this. Um, and so Eventually, there's a pretty logical turnaround. I have seen people go up the steep part to get up on the, the ridge over here, I think. Um, not recommended for beginners or, or most folks. Um, but great views. Uh, on a stormy day, don't go to White River Canyon. Uh, just don't. Um, it's wide open, so the wind is kind of blowing the snow in your face. You'll have no views, most likely. Um, so it's, again, pick your days based on weather. Uh, the nice thing about White River Canyon is it does have a little bit of a it's on slightly on the east side of the crest. And so again, like Twin Lakes, slightly more likely to be uh, snow than rain if it's on the edge. And, and it's also a little, little higher elevation than some of the other ones like Mirror Lake or Tomatoes Falls. All right, and for the romantics out there, Valentine's Day is coming up. Um, the recipe for romance with snowshoeing is you've got your snowshoes, Time it, and this can be really tricky. You could miss a whole winter pretty easily uh, on Mount Hood. But time a full moon uh, snowshoeing trip with a clear night. Full moon, and I've been out snowshoeing on full moons where it's overcast, and it's actually still really bright because you're on the snow, and any and all a little bit of light still reflects pretty well. But it's really ideal if you can get out there to somewhere like White River um, on a full moon. 
uh, snowshoe. And, and you can do this, um, you know, in March and April when it gets a little warmer too. Um, and, and it's just a pretty magical experience. Um, may or may not be where I, I got engaged. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're looking for that opportunity, uh, this can up the, the odds that the answer will be yes. Uh, if, if the questions pops on a full moon snowshoe trip. Um, if you do a full moon outing, um, all those safety things just kind of go up a whole nother level. Like it's definitely, you know, both the driving and visibility definitely have flashlights or headlamps. Um, you, you might not need to use them, but you definitely want to have them handy just in case. And, you know, weather can turn faster at night. So it's, add in all those safety precautions times too, but uh, full moon snowshoe, gotta love it. Um, so rounding out here, uh, my portion of the presentation, we'll get to some Q&A. Um, if, if you're interested, it'd be great if folks wanted to become a member of Oregon Wild. It's a great way to get involved, learn about um, our upcoming presentations and um, other things we're involved in, uh, getting timely um, information on how to engage and help protect these natural treasures that sometimes we take for granted as just great playgrounds for us to get out and explore. Um, these areas don't protect themselves. So if you want to join Oregon Wild, an organization that's working to uh, protect these, these uh, special places, uh, that would be great. Uh, you can do that on our website. There'll be a link in the email, follow-up email we send you. Uh, we've got a volunteer page on our website if you're interested as well. Um, and then just, you know, simple things. Uh, call your member of Congress leave a voicemail and just say, hey, do a better job of protecting Mount Hood, please, or do a better job of protecting wildlife habitat and clean water and pass the River Democracy Act. You don't have to be an expert. A simple call, a simple email, it makes a difference. I, I work with these members of Congress and I, I, I know firsthand from talking to them that they are tracking it. And, and if they're hearing about people, it, it moves the needle politically. Um, if you own a business and you want to endorse a, a campaign to protect certain areas, um, that's great. Let us know. Writing letters to the editor is still helpful um, uh, as far as uh, making sure uh, we're educating the public and uh, drawing attention to this to elected officials and decision makers. So lots of different ways to get involved. Um, and so maybe I'm going to turn this back to you, Aaron, and we'll uh, see if there's some questions. Hello, I'm back, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I only have a few questions. Maybe a few more will um, enter into the chat uh, as as now we're in that official section. Um, I, I don't think it was mentioned, uh, Eric, in your gear chat, but pants. Yeah. Um, I mean, no here, though, presumably. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> pants, recommended. <laughs> um, it, yeah, definitely. Uh, preferable to have snow pants. If you're going out on a stormy day or a really cold day, you kind of need snow pants. Uh, but a lot of times I have these like, um, they're, they're sort of like track pants with a sort of cotton liner. And if it's not too cold out, I'll wear those a lot of times. Um, they're not at all waterproof like snow pants. So if it's snowing out, I'm not going to wear those. Um, if it's springtime, you'll see people in shorts. Um, but yeah, de definitely uh, recommend uh, snow pants. Um, if, you know, if it's a sunny day and it's 30 degrees, you're going to be just fine with sweatpants, um, or, or yoga pants. Like you, you'll see that just don't, don't, um, do anything but snow pants if it's looking colder or stormy. Um, resources for checking snow levels or road conditions. Yes. Great question. I should just add something in on that because I think that's come up before, um, I always like the NOAA forecast because they more oftentimes will put uh, what the freezing level is going to be and, and tend to have uh, a, a forecast for how much snow tonight, tomorrow. Um, I put less stock, a lot less stock in whatever the generic weather app is that probably comes with your phone. Um, so NOAA seems to be a little bit better. Um, and then I would always say check but verify. And if you look at, uh, just Google trip check, Oregon trip check. That has all of the webcams in Oregon on there on a map, and you can kind of zoom into the Mount Hood area, and you'll see. You can click on any of the ones at Government Camp, or there's one right near Frog Lake, which is really helpful. 
And so you can see if the road is snow covered, it's probably snowing, probably not raining. Um, there are also weather stations on there. So you can click and see what the temperature is. And that's another great hint. Um, the pictures don't lie, forecasts can be wrong, but I like to try to take all that information together. Um, the ski areas uh, like Ski Bowl or uh, Mount Hood Meadows have um, information on there. They, they have, usually have like a conditions page. Timberline has it too, but theirs is up higher than most other snowshoeing uh, places people will go. You can also, I should say, you can snowshoe at uh, Meadows and Timberline. I, I think you can at Ski Bowl as well. Um, so that, that's another place to check. They'll have more webcams there as well. Um, so yeah, again, the, the webcams I, I really like to check before I leave. Snow covered roads, you, you can tell if it's snowing or not. Check the temperature and go from there. Good question. Um, what is generally snowshoe season these days? I know that, so anecdotally, uh, Eric and I um, go, the Oregon Wild has had an annual um, snow trip where we go tubing down at White River Canyon. And there are years that that has been uh, postponed because there hasn't been snow in January or enough snow in at White River Canyon. So uh, what are you seeing in is, is, is um, snowshoeing season these days? Yeah, great question. Um, it, it's it's getting more variable. Obviously, this is uh, all snow sports are going to um, be heavily influenced by climate change. As of now, though, the, still the, the normal pattern for the Cascades around Mount Hood is by middle of January, most every year, you've got a, a good snow pack at all of the places we've talked about or anywhere you're going to snowshoe by, by mid January. You may have good conditions to go in late November sometimes at some of the higher elevation ones, it just, it's very, it's much more variable. Like you could have, um, Tamanos Falls could be great the last week of November, just, you know, we got some weird early season storms and then it warms up early December and two weeks later, you may not be able to go. So it's just a little more variable early season. I would say by mid January, so kind of where we are now, and, and this year has been a good snow year so far, I'd say you don't need to worry about the snow pack for snowshoeing, you just need to think about what are the surface conditions? You know, is it gonna be icy from what happened last night or the night before, or is it going to be uh, a, a fresh powder or is it gonna be blue skies? So, so that's kind of what I would be thinking about as far as that goes. Okay, and oh, um, is Mount Hood part of the 4% of protected Oregon areas? Yes, uh, well, yes and no. Um, so part of Mount Hood, so there's there's Mount Hood itself, which is a, a summit and the shoulders. Um, and then there's the Mount Hood National Forest. A lot of different people think of Mount Hood and, and how much it actually encompasses different ways. Um, but the, the summit of Mount Hood and a good chunk of the area directly surrounding the summit is protected as wilderness. Um, carve outs for the ski areas on the south side um, and then uh, we are looking to expand that protection. So uh, on the east side of Mount Hood, like the Bluegrass Ridge area, um, one side of the ridge is protected, the other side is not. Um, and then on the north side, um, you know, if you've done the Vista Ridge Trail, that is the upper part of it is protected, the, the trailhead is not. And so we've fought a logging project there just a couple of years ago. So um, yes and no. High, general answer, higher elevation of Mount Hood is more likely protected. The lower ele you get ele in elevation, the less likely it is to be protected. Do you have suggestions for um, Forest Service roads or trails that are, are not snow parks? Like, are there hiking trails that convert over uh, into hiking uh, or snowshoe areas? Yeah, that, that can be, that can certainly happen. I I'm, I'm always hesitate to recommend that because I could recommend a certain spot that sometimes is great and tomorrow might be terrible, might not be plow. You, you end up getting really variable conditions, but um, for those who are looking to do that type of um, getting away from the designated snow parks that are a little more uh, populated, um, the one that I, I mentioned earlier, the Lost Creek, Old Maid Flat, um, that area is it kind of fits that description. Sometimes you can go drive a certain distance in, sometimes you drive farther in. Um, 
but there's not a ton of that on Mount Hood. There just isn't. Um, it, if if you look at the the once you start getting higher up on the mountain where the snow is consistent, it, you know it's plowed and you got big tall snow banks on the side, closing a lot of those roads that are you know lead to trailheads in the summer or elsewhere. Um, so there's just not a ton of that. You you can find some places if the conditions are right. Um, what's the uh, the name of the road? I'm forgetting. Uh, it goes along oh Still Creek Road. Um, depending on where the snow levels are, you can you can go back in there a little ways. Um, but again, be extra careful. You don't want to get stuck in there. It's not as many people, so safety is another dynamic. Um, and 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 that road is kind of steady elevation change, so you kind of got to watch that. Some people might go up uh, Salmon River Road, um, which eventually usually is snow covered. But again, if the conditions are just right and the snow levels are just right, you might be able to get to a spot where it's safe. Um, again, I should do this a caveat here. Um, there are a lot of not safe places people park these days on areas that are supposed to be plowed and it creates a nightmare for everyone. So park smart. Um, there, those conditions that this person asked about, they're there and you can do that safely. Um, you just got to be thoughtful about it. Um, are there any sites you go to check for like trip reports? Uh, yeah, for trip reports, um, gosh, I haven't been tracking as many of those. Um, Portland Hiker, I, I think has sometimes has some good snowshoeing updates on it. Um, Gosh, that you know, I should know the answer to that question. I I I don't have it handy off the top of my head, but I'm I'm gonna have to go and look now because that's I, I know in other parts of the state there's Nordic uh, groups, and so you know you could look at like Teacup Nordic um, Club or any other of, of any of the other Nordic clubs um, on Facebook. They oftentimes have people doing trip reports on those pages. Um, sometimes those are open. Sometimes you have to ask to join. Um, but those can give you some good, you know, it's, it's one more reference. They may not have your trail from today, but they might have something from a similar elevation, same side of the mountain kind of thing. So it could, could be helpful. Um, one thing that I'll throw in, and you have to take it with a grain of salt, but I've done this before, is um, if you have Instagram, you can check areas where people have taken pictures. And so like, Frog Lake, you can put in Frog Lake and look at Frog Lake geotags and you can see pictures people have posted. Now that doesn't mean they posted it yesterday or this morning or something like that, but generally from one of the popular places, you can kind of check out um, and get a, a sense of, okay, is there snow there? What does it look like? Um, uh, and so I've used, that's been useful uh, once in a while, especially if you're saying like, well, is there snow at this location? Um, just looking at Instagram and, and 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 also making sure that you're looking at the date or and time that it was posted, because sometimes it, it's not in a chronological order. But I found that helpful. Um, we're we're going over time, so I'm just going to do two more um, questions. Um, this is from uh, Casey. Hey, Casey, who joined our staff uh, this year. Um, is there any good snowshoeing from Timberline? Yes, there, most ski areas in Oregon have uh, some, some option for snowshoeing. So you can certainly uh, go snowshoeing up there. You're at a ski area. So if it's a weekend in the, you know, around the holidays or anything, getting a parking spot can be a little tricky. So factor that in. But um, yeah, snowshoeing at Timberline can be great. Again, thinking about weather conditions ahead of time. If it's a stormy day, bad choice um, because it's it's pretty open up at that elevation, and you're gonna just be you'll have no views and snow blown in your face. No, thank you. Go to Twin Lakes or one of the other options that's more in the forest. Um, but on a clear day, it's nice higher. It's a higher elevation spot. So on the shoulder seasons, that can also make it. Uh, a little longer season, and I'm I realizing I forgot to answer the second part of the what's the snowshoeing season. Um, at some of these places, it, you know, like Timberline, you can do the snowshoe routes um, to the end of March at least, if not longer. Um, and then the meltout season, things start to get um, snow, dirt, snow, dirt. Um, and I think that's unfortunately what climate change is going to probably have seen more of. But um, 
but yeah, so Timberline can be a, a good choice. Um, oh, but you have to deal with skier traffic. Yeah, it, exactly. That's the caveat: skier traffic and skier parking as well to get up there. And and the the road up to Timberline, it's not for beginner drivers on snow. I, I will add that in as well. Um, and I think this is just a uh, uh, kind of a, a note. Lost Creeks on Lolo Pass was that the road you? Ah, uh, yes. Out? Thank you. I was thinking when, that might have been it too. Um, but yes. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you to whoever <laughs> put that in. Lolo Pass Anonymous. Road. Anonymous is, is helping you out there. Right. Um, and uh, we've got a few more questions, but I think that we're, we're over time. Um, so I'm going to thank everybody for, um, for attending. And thank you, Eric. Um, we will have a recording of this that we'll send around. We'll have some more resources that will be um, linked to in, in an um, email that goes out. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing Central Oregon. And then, as mentioned, um, the week after that, we have uh, the Natural History of the Klamath Mountains. Um, a few other Oregon Wild things. Uh, we are hiring a, um, a new development position, a membership associate. You can find that. Um, it's on our webpage. It's on our LinkedIn page. I think it'll get up on some of the other social media um, later this week. Um, but you can find it on the web page now. So share that far and wide. Um, we'd love to see lots of people applying for that. Um, and I think that's all we have for right now. Eric, any parting words? No, go go out, have fun, enjoy snowshoeing. Um, again, hopefully that safety talk wasn't uh, too scary um, and mostly just entertaining, but you know, be safe. Um, yeah, it's, it's fun. Uh, I hope you all have a chance to get out there and Maybe find somewhere new or um, get out there for the first time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.